So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm go I have the pleasure and the honor to initiate this uh, transatlantic lectures for this year, for uh, the new academic year. It's uh, my pleasure being here. Thank you very much for the organizers. Uh, uh, Friedrich, that is uh, the shadow of the, of the idea and uh, the man that does the work, Dimitrios, uh, for the good work they've done together. So thank you very much for uh, working on, the, on this uh, initiative of our LPS program. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And all the other colleagues, of course, uh, Professor Bern Opperman, uh, Professor Francisco Balaguer Calero, Professor Patrick Hug. It's a pleasure having you here in this uh, inaugural conference. I was, I'm going to talk uh, Europe, what now? And all has to do with the war. And I could, as I did in, I did in Granada before, uh, name this conference War and Peace in Europe uh, using the name of Tolstoy, uh, of the, <laughs> the great romance uh, of war in Europe, or uh, war and peace in Europe. And uh, what can we say? Suddenly, war breaks out in Europe after Putin's Russia invaded, invaded Ukraine in a violation of international law and order. And the first reaction was the surprise or even stupefaction because it happened. We did not want to believe that a war was still possible today in the 21st century. And that has to do with the Kant's idea of perpetual peace that made us pay no attention to the signs of possible wars to come on the 21st century. In a review I, I, I used to read, a philosophical review, there is a fictional dialogue between Hegel, Kant, and Nietzsche. And Nietzsche points his, his finger to Kant and says, you are to blame. You are to, to responsible for that idea, stupid idea, that it could happen uh, peace in Europe and that peace would endure forever. And uh, Kant replies to him, indeed, I'm responsible for that idea, but uh, in my view, that had two conditions that were not fulfilled. And the two conditions were the democratic regimes all over uh, Europe and the good men ruling the nations. And uh, Kant says, uh, a little bit sad, that's something that is not very usual nowadays. I don't know whom is thinking <laughs> or whom could he be thinking on, but he said, well, this thing of the good men's ruling the world is something that nowadays is very rare. But if we did not pay attention, some signs of latent war, however, were there. Uh, we had the disintegration of Yugoslavia, we have the situation of Kosovo, we have the Aryan Russian invasion to the Donbass area, and these were real signs of war to which we did not pay attention. And the war in Europe, it's a real earthquake in the political and economic situation in Europe and in the world. And it changed the whole scenario that was being prepared. First, let us see from the immediate political consequences. It brought more cohesion, more cohesion to the European Union and more cohesion even outside the European Union. In the European Union, there was a unanimity on condemning the invasion of Russia and on imposing economic sanctions against Russia. And uh, there were common policy and military objectives that were defined together with NATO. And uh, there is a common response to the political crisis. 
that brought a, a minimization of political divergences that are still there, but uh, were in this moment are not so clear as they have been before. Inside the EU, well, the critics, the criticism against the positions of Hungary, Poland, and this group countries were relativized and minimized in the view of this common policy, common position against Russia. And Poland especially becomes the good Samaritan for Ukrainian refugees. And nobody wants to say bad about the good Samaritan, uh, not to fight him, not to say something that can uh, hurry him. But outside the EU, we had a uh, rapprochement in the international political area between Europe and the uh, United Kingdom after Brexit. And um, there is a common position that is uh, also uh, subscribed by the British. And we attended uh, in the even to a kind of contest to take the same positions when uh, there were successive visits to Kiev of the Commission President von der Leyen, immediately followed by Boris Johnson, immediately followed by the President of the European Council, immediately followed by Boris Johnson. Everyone was uh, in a kind of contest uh, of who visits more time the, uh, the, the Ukrainian. But we also had the resurrection of NATO after the Russian threat, both on the American and European side. One could say, like Mark Twain, that the news of NATO's death mm -hmm. were largely exaggerated. Uh, and uh, the military support to Ukraine, if, even if it's not a member of the alliance, shows that. And the new candidates, candidates for membership, Finland and Sweden, uh, are a part of a new spirit that tries to reuse and rediscover the alliance as an opportunity for possible new alliances, agreements, and political combinations in Europe and the world. But we still have the rise of populism inside and outside Europe. And uh, this populism became even more evident after the war. Uh, if you look at the situation in Europe, we have uh, radical populists uh, that took office in Hungary, in Poland, in Sweden, in Italy, uh, uh, the West. Uh, uh, and we, even if about Italy, you can always say that things are not exactly what they look like. Uh, I was with Paco uh, last week in Granada and our Italian colleagues saying that the first uh, political act of uh, Mrs. Meloni was to ask the president Mattarella to uh, postpone uh, his, her uh, inauguration of, of the church in order that uh, Draghi can do the, the, the can, can write the, uh, how to call it, uh, the, the rules for for the for the for the year economic year the budget in order that he can uh, do the budget two arguments uh, Fratelli d'Italia never made a budget not even to the party everybody understand that and uh, they can they don't know how to do a budget for the state and second they are against Europe but they don't want to get the money so it's good to have Draghi to do the budgets, otherwise they will the money. Uh, two main reasons uh, that are very, uh, uh, well, very efficient for a future uh, Italy in European Union. But if these are the places where the populace took the government, there are some other places uh, where they scare everybody in the next electoral, uh, electoral election, 
uh, well, uh, we have Germany uh, with uh, the problems of the extreme right. We have France. Uh, oh, we had a, a great hurry some uh, uh, months ago because uh, we did know who win the second turn. We have problems in Spain uh, with Vox. We have problems in Portugal with Chega. That is now the third political party in the in the parliament, and so on. And we have the same problem outside Europe. Trump, Bolsonaro, Putin are threats, populist threats to the uh, situation that we are living in. And that creates another problem that is the risk of the, the, the democracy, democracy foundations themselves. Uh, the idea that can put in danger, that can be a threat to the um, to the democracy all over the world. What future for Europe now? Well, first of all, we had short-term and long-term consequences from the point of view of economy, from the economic point of view. Uh, the economic crisis that is in part determined by the economic uh, effects of Russia's sanctions, but uh, there is a situation of stagnation in Europe that all the economists agree on it, combined with inflation. So we are back to the old 80s and 90s where the economists talked about a new monster. There was stagflation, a mix of stagnation and inflation. And uh, we need uh, a new solution to Europe's energy dependence. Uh, the situation of today, as we were talking before, uh, seems to be promising because there is agreement of the Iberian countries with, with France that can help a little bit uh, to solve the problems, of, the energetic problems of Europe, but that's not enough. And we need to find renewable sources, diversif diversification of sources, new energy policy, like our friend Swedish uh, says very well in the statement on the Alpes review. But uh, from that point of view, there are two main goals in the short term and middle term questions of the European Union, the try of creating a common policy in terms of recovering the economic situation and common energy policy. They are, these are the two main topics uh, in order to solve the problem of the stagflation. But there are also the problems of the present because we are having already problems in applying the old plans. The plans that were planned to fight COVID and are insufficient to this new situation that adds to COVID at uh, the war and uh, creates even more problems for the economic situation. There are some possibles for mid and long term solution. According to the papers, they began to be discussed in the last council meeting of Prague uh, and probably continue on this one. And uh, these possible solutions passed by the reuse and readaptation re of the actual plans to the current situations with new objectives and more money. The creation of a new generation of plans in addition to the current readapted ones with new and broader objectives and of course more money specifically designed to deal with post-war problems. The creation of a comprehensive plan that is talking right now, integrating Europe and the US together with uh, not a new common policies in order to be agreed, a pact uh, that, has, that, that would combine uh, US with European money in order to create a new kind of multilateral and global uh, Marshall Plan that is something that has been talked in the, in, the, in, the, in the 
meetings of the of the government of the cabinet of today. But uh, perhaps more important for that, more important than that for us, there are uh, we are constitutionalists and uh, administrativists. We are lawyers uh, in general. There are consequences from the constitution, a constitutional point of view. And uh, from the point of view of multi-level constitution, the state, the European and global constitution, there are new challenges and new tasks uh, that appear uh, from the constitutional situation and uh, are now being uh, taken care of by all the constitutionalists as the new challenges of the constitutional. The first of these four main four tasks are in the beginning, the defense task, or in a broader perspective, internal and external security to include also the terrorism, the banditry, the fight against terrorism, and the, these are all teams. <laughs> These are the teams that explain the creation of the state. These are the teams that have been behind our democratic order. But they were not taken care nowadays as constitutional teams. And now they must be. <laughs> they must be in Germany, uh, where after the war was a taboo to talk about defense. Uh, they must be all over Europe where uh, that question uh, was not uh, in the arena. And now it goes again into the arena. Uh, one thing uh, uh, I've heard from uh, some uh, German and Italian co colleagues in a meeting uh, I've been was that uh, uh, NATO became a team of constitutional relevance. <laughs> and uh, that is new, but at the same time is old because these tests were well known from the constitutionalists of today. Second, we have health. Because we had COVID that is not still yet gone, but uh, we have other health threats, health threats. Because there is always an angry little animal uh, that can uh, bring new viruses. We had the mad cows, the birds with cold, the pigs flu, the bats gone mad. We had the pangolin, and we now are waiting for more animals that were expelled <laughs> from their environment. And, uh, make a revenge to, to the mankind. And all of them are threatened. And the threat now is multiplied by multiple choices. <laughs> because we know the animals we still have that are not yet in a situation of disappearance. And they are all dangerous because they are all attacked. And when they feel attacked, they can create a virus, something we discovered now. But uh, in the last discoveries uh, from a specialist of the Cambridge uh, University, uh, with the, uh, the situation of climate change, new virus uh, that have been uh, frozen uh, will appear nowadays. And we are going to have the virus that killed the dinosaurs that will be able after uh, re, after resurrection uh, with the climate change, we'll be ready to attack mankind. And according to Kemp, Luke Kemp, specials wrote on that, there are already some experiments that are being made on that situation. And uh, they discover that uh, the body of, man, of the man is not prepared for this kind of threats. So health is indeed a new topic for constitutional law. Constitutional law in the global area, 
in European area, in the national area. And uh, this is something that is crucial, needs to think about how the state should handle, uh, puts in question the public system, the public health system, should it exist? Should we create it? Should we keep on him? How can we transform it? And uh, a, a great discussion that go to the, uh, goes to the uh, vaccination, to the medicine, to the treatment of uh, diseases. So a second main task for public, public bodies. Then we have the environment. The environment was, uh, well, a young task of the state. In my view, it came with the crisis of the oil of the city of the 70s of the 20th century uh, that made the, the constitutionalists discover the problem of ecology. But now the problem of uh, ecology has a new dimension, which is the climate change dimension the team we talked about in the fifth volume of our Help is the War review. And by the way, those who did not yet read it, please do because it's important. And in that Cambridge study from Kemp, it says that uh, we are facing a catastrophic effect, which is the possible disappearance of man on earth uh, as a uh, consequence of climate change. Well, uh, it says, well, we are not even complying the Paris Agreement, but the Paris Agreement is not enough nowadays with the war. So if we are not even able to comply the minimum of the Paris Agreement, this means that uh, in uh, 50 ways is a catastrophe, but uh, it's a way of calling uh, the attention to that question in 50 ways. In 50 years, we can uh, come to the disappearance of the man in, in Earth. But the environment question is also another problem, another issue. That is the and powers, the the energy powers at all levels, at global level, at European at the national level. Today, we are having the European Council. And as I said before we began, uh, we have the great news of the agreement of France with Spain and Portugal in the construction of a pipeline between Marce Barcelona and Marseille. Uh, they call it Green in Energy Corridor. And they believe that can be a decision that will after will be taken by the uh, by the European Council because the opposite to this decision until now was uh, France, uh, and uh, well, it already had the German support to that policy, and that can help to distribute the energy. It's better because uh, the dependence from uh, from uh, uh, Russia diminishes, but it does not create energy. It, uh, uh, however, it helps with its distribution and its dis distribution to the Eastern countries, <coughs> which is uh, those, which are those who are more dependent of Russia nowadays. And uh, this problem of uh, energy policy uh, claims for real green energy alternatives. Uh, we have the natural resource, the natural resources, the sun, the wind, the waves that can produce this kind of, of uh, alternative uh, ways of using and creating energy. But you also have some problems of misconceptions of what is green and what is not. And the nuclear uh, energy is part of that problem. It was a French guy, a French philosopher, Luc Ferry, in his book, Recette Ecologies, so Recette Ecologie, 
the seven ecologies, that talks about uh, a new kind of uh, uh, ecology uh, philosophy that he defends, that he called uh, eco modernism. He s'appelle an eco modernist, a Swanem, again, it's a très français, uh, uh, it's typical French to find uh, uh, a name to, to qualify himself. <laughs> is an eco modernist, not not an, an ecologist like the other, but a real ec, a real modernist one. And uh, this eco modernist, uh, this eco modernist, defend the idea that nuclear energy is a green uh, energy. And unfortunately, that is an expression I have already heard from Commissioner Van der Leyen and from Chancellor Scholz yesterday. I'm afraid. And uh, I think that's too dangerous because the nuclear has two main problems. The problems of nuclear waste, nobody knows yet how to deal with nuclear waste. So that's a risk, a real risk for the environment. But then there's also a risk of catastrophic situations, being them natural or man provoked. It. We just need to look at what is happening now at the Zaporizhia Atomic uh, Central Station. There is in the middle of war between Ukraine and Russia to be suspicious about the qualities of nuclear uh, energy and uh, about the possibility of calling it a green uh, form of energy without knowing if it is a modern or not because it, it exists for a long time uh, like the eco-modernist because Hugo Ferry before already talked about uh, ecology. The fourth problem of uh, um, constitutional multi of multi-level constitution is the problem of digital and uh, the advantage and disadvantages of its generalization. We cannot live in our era without digital. And that is something that our friend Paco studied in a very deep and complete way. And uh, the use of digital by the politic power, powers, by power, politics in general and by the lawyers, created law bites and fake news. And these things are more and more generalized and uh, create lots of problems, as Paco says. But I, I'm going to use just one that I noticed. Uh, I assisted in uh, uh, one of these days working at the Brazilian uh, television where I saw uh, a gentlewoman saying, I've seen with my eyes in the internet, there was a fraud in these elections. I've seen the polls. There's no doubt that there is a fraud. And uh, I've heard that also in the States. And that's really a problem for fake news and a problem for democracy. So we need to find new ways of working with the digital thing we need to find something that also Opperman does uh, from the point of view of private law. And by the way, and no, uh, without advertisement, I have here his last book, Automatisiertes uh, Sistema, that uh, deals with the situation of uh, uh, the digital in the field of private law. And there is a guy named Pereira da Silva, that also speaks something about public law, but it's a book basically about the dangers of this situation from the private law point of view. So these are the four new topics of constitution nowadays. And by the way, I propose to my colleagues of CIPE, of the CIPE uh, uh, Commission, that we should do those three topics in the next meeting that will be in Lisbon. 
So it will be an opportunity also to make the constitutional study of these things. But we have also institutional changes and uh, outside Europe, and we need them badly. First of all, we need of a roadmap and some constitutional changes or simple adaptations on the behavior of global institutions. We need to recreate the United Nations and try to make them work. Someone said that the United Nations is one of the first victims of this new war. Indeed, it's, it's a difficult task. Uh, uh, United Nations are the consequence of the Second War, World War. They have uh, uh, a scheme that was conceived for the leading uh, powers at the time, but we have to renovate them and perhaps change uh, the leaders of this system. And uh, probably we also need a kind of more balanced division of power between the General Assembly and the Council. And that's something that we have to try uh, not to give preeminence to neither of them, but try to conciliate both organs in the future. Then we need to reinvent NATO and uh, to increase the military participation of all members in the common military defense. That's something that is uh, crucial. Uh, well, we talked about it from the point of view of the Constitution. Now I'm talking about it from the point of view of NATO that also needs to be uh, reformed. But we also need badly uh, a kind of uh, economic or political institution or at least some kind of agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom to increase economic cooperation and political cooperation beyond the Brexit. And uh, if we are including the United Kingdom, we also have to think about other partners, not necessarily European. But looking more carefully to Europe, I think we have also to uh, uh, redefine Europe. And we should redefine it according to a multi level point of view. Perhaps in the future, we, apart from the multi level that includes Europe, should include a multi level itself for European organization. When I say there was a discussion in the past about the speed of the integration, and I even heard once Dimitrios in the CPA meeting talking about that and talking about the two or three speeds, Europe's European speeds for the integration. But that's something already in the past. It was not some time ago, but now probably it's already something in the past. And uh, we should think about real levels of organization of uh, uh, the Europe itself, taking that old idea of the, uh, of the, I'm not in the best conditions today, the idea of the speeds and uh, making them a free level uh, construction uh, for Europe. And in my view, and in the present situation, we should talk about free levels for European organization uh, according to the present situation. The first level is the actual level of progress of the EU, the European Union, and uh, increasing it with more integration and more common policies for those states who are willing to follow that joint path. We should keep on going on, no matter what the others do. So create a basis, nuclear, 
group of countries that will take the lead in the old times, like Dimitri said, that would be in the first speed of Europe. And that they should be uh, a part, a level of the uh, Euro Europe now. Then we should have a second level integrated in Europe, but apart as organization. A part where we will integrate also Europe as a common market, just a common market. No uh, uh, the European Union, no uh, complete integration. We come back to the times of the common market. And uh, we don't adopt the principle of primacy of community law, of European law. Because we know that principle is not regarded in Poland, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, uh, and these great countries, and the situation is getting worse. Last week, I had the visit of two colleagues from Poland, and uh, they said that uh, the problem of the, the primacy of community law, of European law, is not just a problem for the Constitution. Uh, they say it is, but that's the minimum of the problems. They don't accept primacy to, uh, uh, to the regular law or even to uh, uh, an administrative decision. So there are in power administrative decisions that are against common law and nobody uh, uh, brought these cases to the court. So the problem is even worse than we feared. And this second wave of Europe, they would not affect the other one, uh, should be a place where we could have uh, the Hungary, uh, we could have the Hungarians, the Polish, the Italians. <laughs> we don't know what will happen in Italy in the future. And it can happen also, I uh, hope not, in Germany, in Portugal, in France, we never know, in Spain, we never know. Let's hope not. And uh, that would be a level of the European uh, com common market. And then we, I think we should have something that was uh, experienced for the first time in Prague. I was glad because I talked about this, about it one week before in, in, uh, in Granada and I didn't know about what was going to happen in Prague. So <laughs> uh, it was a kind of Europe as a minimum of economic and political cooperation. With the specific economic agreements and some unification of political positions. That would bring a broader notion to Europe. We could integrate the United Kingdom, Turkey, Ukraine, even at war, because uh, after war, we don't know when the war ends. And speaking clearly, they are not in conditions uh, uh, of being a European country. They are very good, very active, very uh, narrow-minded, very open-minded. But as a matter of fact, uh, they don't know how things work. And the West represents of the commission that were there were a little bit uh, sad about something they heard from the uh, from Ukraine members of the government and of the parliament and so on, because though some things they heard are understandable in a war situation, but they cannot be a basis of a democratic country because some of them were against human rights. So, uh, but they are indeed fighting for us, fighting for democracy, and they should be integrated. Uh, and they could be immediately integrated in this level of a minimum of economic and political cooperation. But thinking about that, that already happened in, in Prague, uh, and they talk about the idea of having, of having at the same time uh, an open council and a political council, political EU, it was the name uh, found in Prague, but, but we can uh, think about any other ones. 
And that could be a solution for the situation in Europe. Because from one time, it does not put in question the unity and the unity that goes abroad and has frontiers. They are not only the frontiers of the European Union as itself, and at the same time creates an intermediate situation for those who want something of Europe, but they are not interested in having the whole uh, the whole uh, menu, the whole, uh, the the all the policies that need to be uh, improved at European level. But that is future, and nobody knows what future will look like. So what to do now, Europe? I think, speaking clearly, that we should adopt the Central European proverb that says, on the eve of the end of the world, I must keep on planting apple trees. Let's plant apple trees. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now it's time for the questions. <laughs> yeah. Paco knew already some of these things because in yeah. another meeting, <laughs> I, I've told him Spanish or something that looked like I agree, Spanish. I agree with you in uh, all terms and then I don't have a, uh, a question I will have a uh, comments but uh, no question because I agree with you uh, the first is uh, the position of through in uh, in a war we, we are in a situation of war now and uh, we have a lot of problems uh, with through and one, one of the problems particularly uh, the, the question of uh, how to define nuclear energy i am not uh, completely against uh, nuclear energy i understand that uh, at, uh, in this moment uh, we need to use all the sources of energy that uh, we can have because uh, we are in a, in a special situation and uh, if we uh, can use provisory i mean not uh, not uh, uh, in the in the sense of uh, having nuclear energy for the future but uh, uh, at least 3 months like uh, in, in germany or uh, a provisory uh, situation to face uh, the, the the problems that we have uh, with the war i agree with that but I, there is no need of changing the nature of uh, the scenes. I mean, you cannot say that uh, nuclear energy is clean only because you need at this moment uh, uh, nuclear energy. And that's, that's the problem for me. I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, if we maintain the, the through, I can understand and I can accept that uh, nuclear energy is uh, needed. I, I, I suppose that the, most of the people in, in Europe uh, understand that uh, we don't have perhaps for a number of months, uh, another possibility. But, uh, but uh, that uh, is one thing. And the other thing is uh, to define uh, uh, energy that is uh, dangerous uh, as uh, clean energy. That's, that is uh, one point. The second point is, what can, what can we do with uh, England, with the United Kingdom? Because uh, we need to, to uh, secure the stability in the United Kingdom. You know, at the moment, it's a very uh, problematic situation. Uh, they, they left uh, the European Union and they promise a very nice future. And uh, at the moment, they change, uh, well, uh, any uh, three or four months from prime minister. And this is not good for the United Kingdom and not good for Europe. And for the world, because we need a we need a very uh, uh, strong stability in the United Kingdom. This is a, a central piece in the in the construction of Europe, even if uh, at the moment it's not uh, uh, unfortunately part of Europe. I, I agree with you that we need to uh, rethink and to propose uh, to United Kingdom uh, some kind of collaboration with Europe. We are together. We have uh, we have very strong uh, very strong problems in Europe. We, we have the problem of Russia, and we need uh, not only in the framework of the NATO, but also 
uh, in the uh, uh, common market and, and the, the building of some kind of uh, Europe with the United Kingdom. That will be uh, a very good uh, news uh, for Europe and for the United Kingdom at the moment. And the other question, this is uh, always common, but because it's not a question uh, I agree with you in all uh, the terms. Um, the other question is uh, the, the situation of the uh, liberal system. I, I don't like to call um, Poland or Hungary uh, illiberal democr democracies because they are not democracies, they are a liberal system. And we have a problem uh, in the moment, it's a problem from uh, for several years ago uh, that uh, continues to, to, to be a problem, is we focus a lot of our political efforts, uh, a lot of uh, uh, political thinking and acting in Europe in, uh, in face facing those uh, liberal system. And this is a very problematic situation because we cannot solve all the problems that we have, for instance, digital problems, the problems in digital world, and other problems because we have to focus permanently in, uh, in the, the situation of the uh, liberal system. So we need uh, to do something uh, about that. And a good solution will be to have a, a different position of those uh, a liberal system in, in Europe. And, and we can go on with uh, our own uh, uh, future, uh, integrating in some way, in an economic way, those uh, systems, but uh, at the same time, uh, making a force to, to build uh, Europe, to, to establish a, a very strong uh, 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 institutions in, in Europe, because I see, I, in my opinion, in my view, I, I think it could be, of course, uh, a mistake, but uh, I think that uh, if we had had a very strong Europe before the war in Ukraine, perhaps we didn't have a war in Ukraine because uh, Russia will have a, a strong power, not only the United States that uh, at the end is uh, very far from Russia, and, uh, but uh, also a very strong power in, uh, in Europe uh, is uh, uh, positive to avoid uh, those situations of war uh, in the future. So uh, it's, it was only some comments, uh, and uh, as I say, I agree completely with you. Thank you very much, my dear Paco. It's food for thought uh, because we are discussing what is happening. And it's uh, interesting about uh, uh, the situation now. Regarding nuclear energy, we agree that uh, nuclear energy cannot be green. And that's something important. Uh, uh, this idea of uh, making of it a new green way of producing energy does not seem right to me and to you too. But the idea of a provisory solution, the only problem with that is that provisory solutions tend to be definitive solutions, especially in, in countries like Portugal and Spain. Uh, in the faculty, we are still using a, provi a provisional room that was built in the 50s and uh, it was supposed to have dis disappeared uh, meanwhile and it keeps on going. So we must be careful when we talk about provisory solution. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, I think, on the other hand, that we should develop real alternative uh, ways of producing energy. And by the way, uh, perhaps we are, because we are a little country of Europe, because we have no nuclear, uh, we have uh, made great efforts to use the winds, to use the sun, to use uh, the waves in order to produce energy. And I believe that we have a rate that from the economical point, from the European point of view, is very high of using uh, alternative uh, energies. So perhaps we should think about these alternative ways and then, but in a provisory way, if we need also the nuclear, but never calling, as you say, also uh, as, a, as a, something that is green. Uh, what to do with the UK? Yeah, of course, that's a problem. 
uh, the good thing is they did not yet go away from the uh, from Uyghur point of view. Because, and I was talking with a, a, a also a British colleague one of these days, and uh, maybe you know, but you know what the uh, the Pallium, the the British Pallium did during the last year. The only work he done from the new uh, political legislative point of view, what, the only thing he has done was to nationalize European war. There is now an internal law with no changes from European law. And they say, well, in the future we'll change. But until now, it's the same, <laughs> exactly the same. Uh, from environmental to uh, economical situation, from, uh, from the markets, everything is like it was before. Why? Because with the Brexit, they lost all the administrative war they had, and which source was an administrative one and was for them European one. So if they, uh, they leave, they lost immediately everything. And since that was a problem, <laughs> they tried and they were able to nationalize environmental law. So we can still have a hope. <laughs> it's not wait. <laughs> That's why I was joking in the beginning when I say, well, you are forgiven. Come back, please. And if they don't come, we have to cut, we have to find a situation in order to be united with a minimum of common uh, principles, democracy as a, as a key issue, uh, but uh, some political and uh, economic ideas. Uh, regarding uh, the the iWebro system, I agree with you. It's a, it's a, a contradiction. But it's a contradiction, a contradiction they created. I guess. That's why the name was generalized, as you know. Uh, it was the, the Hungarian president uh, who used that expression. Uh, and, um, well, indeed, I agree with you. The problem is that they are not a real democracy. And uh, we need to, to do something from the European point of view. But since now it's very difficult to do it, uh, the only situation or, the, or future situation could be that second level of the common market. Regarding uh, the war, no war in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, that I'm not so sure because uh, if you look at everything that Putin has said, uh, they say Ukraine is Russia. And uh, the Ukrainian, today I heard uh, a guy from uh, uh, an autarchy from a uh, uh, municipality saying that uh, uh, we and the Ukrainians are exactly the same. There's no difference between us. It's a philosophy he's been defending for some time. Uh, and since he's in the crisis with the disappearance of the uh, disappearance of the, the, the USSR, now, uh, well, it's a kind of compensation. But uh, I don't know. But we are talking about what could have happened, and we never know. We need to try. We need to, to uh, as in a joke in Portugal, we need to try the apple to know if it's good. <laughs> uh, but it could be. It could be a, a, an hypothesis. Hypothesis. More questions, my friends. I have a question, Bosco. Yeah, please. Or a comment or whatever you want. Uh, or criticism. Uh, yeah, great. Um, we all realize, I think, how important it would be to renovate the United Nations. How do we do that? Well, discussing, uh, showing the situation, doing a uh, lobby for new uh, methods and using uh, the right of vote of the countries. Uh, uh, well, some of those things were taught from a long time. Uh, the idea of replacing uh, uh, the United Kingdom uh, uh, and France uh, 
and including the EU. It was an idea that has been uh, on the table of discussion, uh, more balancing the power, something were already made uh, between the, the General Assembly and, uh, and the Council. I, I had the luck of when I was more young, I've been working with Freitas Guamaral, uh, that has been my professor of uh, administrative law, and he has been one of the uh, presidents of the General Assembly of the UN. So some of those things uh, are being talked for uh, 30, 40 years, even more. Yeah, sure. uh, uh, but we, sh we have to keep step after step. Uh, and uh, I believe that already some things are uh, noticed already with a more diffusion of the decisions of the of the general assembly uh, they are not uh, uh, marked by the uh, by the block situation at the uh, global level and perhaps can be more representative of the uh, effective situation but of course it's a, almost an impossible task yeah but perhaps you can help me because you know much more about the UN than I do. <laughs> it's a, there's some discussion going on on various blogs about ways to circumvent the vetoes, uh, but they're so theoretical and I don't have the answer, um, but yeah. it, it's needed. Yeah, indeed. It's a problem. Well, in Europe, we've tried uh, this system of uh, votes uh, that are not uh, that don't, don't give a veto to any country but right. it's an agreement of, of uh, states in order to have a veto so these kind of solutions uh, two third uh, uh, 40 percent 60 percent 80 percent perhaps you should keep on trying this kind of solutions but they have been working quite well in Europe. Well, even if in some cases there are no decisions. The problem with Hungary and Poland is, is that one. Uh, the system did not conduct to decisions. And that when they were thought to be applied, we had the war and uh, the situation changed completely. So, Bern. Yes, thank you, Vasco, for the, uh, as always, uh, very uh, inspiring contribution you gave to a question I dare to uh, comment. Um, uh, it reminds me a bit, uh, I'm still fascinated, by the way, of, of um, East Middle Europe or, uh, and Eastern uh, Europe countries, and I don't really understand them always. So um, let me uh, tell a little anecdote. Um, 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, I um, gave a speech on a, um, a small conference at Kashimirsch in Poland, um, where some um, uh, people, um, scientists from uh, Ukraine and from Belarus and from uh, Poland had been present about uh, expanding the inner market of the European Union, which happened later on. And well, after my speech, which was the anecdote, now they asked me, well, they were polite about uh, these contributions to the inner market, but obviously not too much interested. They asked me immediately, what's about our membership of the NATO and uh, how can we get support against the Russians and all that? So, but later on, uh, especially Poland proved under Tusk and Dutch people, Poland proved to be splendid Europeans. So um, I'm not so sure that's my first question whether uh, because they are now under a regime which, is, uh, which has um, different priorities, let's say, uh, why we should uh, bring them into another uh, category of uh, European membership. My second question is, did I understand you correctly that you spoke as a solution, which makes a lot of sense to me, integrating Britain again and uh, the, the, uh, Turkey, um, as well of a Europe of two speeds, um, uh, one economical, the other political, um, or as it uh, is named sometimes variable geometry uh, of Europe. 
some people fear that this means disintegration. Uh, so what's your opinion about that? Great, thank you very much. Uh, great questions. First of all, the Polish. Uh, I love Polish people. Uh, that's not the problem. Uh, the problem is not the people, is the regime uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the people who govern. Um, my, I have a sister-in-law that is Polish. Uh, I have a, a, a little lady of five years old that is my nephew, my, my niece. Uh, a Polish girl. Uh, that's not a problem of, of, of persons. And I believe the majority of the persons uh, and those that I know are against uh, uh, what the rulers say, what the governors say, what says the, the, the prime minister, uh, the president, the parliament, and so on. But the problem is that uh, we are waiting for a democratic solution in a different way, and it does not come. And uh, I've heard also when I was in Granada, uh, some uh, kind of uh, um, gossip, uh, let's say, uh, where the Polish uh, were talking about a possible situation that could arise, which is a coup d'etat from the Prime Minister Kaczynski, uh, that is uh, preparing a constitution and will declare it with a referendum uh, if he loses the next election. Uh, so this is something that is going to be prepared and for, uh, I've seen also, there are some parts of this constitution that have been published by the press. So, but the problem is not the Polish, I, I want it. On the other hand, I wanted they were integrated at more and the most of the people I know from Poland are great Democrats, great lawyers. Our friends from Lublin, for instance, uh, that you know so well, you are a uh, professor, honored professor from Lublin. Uh, they are great, they do a great job, but the problem is the, uh, the representation and the problems with representation. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, the government mainly has taken measures in order to avoid uh, opposition, in order to avoid uh, uh, that uh, uh, counter current, uh, counter ideas can may be expressed. So, uh, and, and for that, I come to the, I come to the same, second question. Uh, my idea is not the, the idea of the, the two speeds. It's the idea of having free levels of Europe. Oh. So free, uh, free, different dimensions. The, uh, the dimension of Europe that want to progress in integration, a second dimension of Europe more in large with those that just want uh, a common market and don't accept common policies and primacy. And the third one just with small connections from political and economic, from the economical minimum of uh, cohesion. And, uh, but this would be different and work in a different way. Uh, there will be the institutions of nowadays for the first level working uh, together for European Union. And uh, then they meet with other countries and other governments on the second level and another one on the first. As a matter of fact, that began to happen uh, nowadays in uh, in uh, in Prague, in the West Meeting of Prague. But uh, in Prague, uh, they were not clear uh, the distinction, and we must make a clear distinction. There is Europe as uh, an integrated uh, uh, area, and there is Europe uh, just as a common market and just as some policies in common and uh, well we should have democracy uh, and the, the search of democracy as something of that political issue but uh, well of course that's difficult to do but I, I don't think that's why I said it's not exactly the idea of the, the speeds mm -hmm. and that, that idea of speeds was rejected because of exactly what you said uh, uh, the idea that could 
destroy the, uh, the integration. But my idea is to create three institutions, the three European free levels of Europe. Uh, I don't know. It's it's it's, it's a proposal, mm -hmm. uh, uh, food for for your thought. Thank you so much. But thank you very much. Friedrich. Well, thank you so much, Vasco, for this uh, wonderful presentation and 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 all the thoughts that you have. Um, well, provoked basically the ideas you've provoked and 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 given us much food for thought. Um, I was wondering um, concerning this three-tier idea of, of, of Europe, um, would you rather say we should try to do something entirely new, so to basically recreate the European Union on these three levels, or should we rather try to bring in line the existing uh, uh, European uh, fora of cooperation like uh, the Council of Europe, uh, the European Economic Area and the European Union as sort of basic um, uh, basic starting points for, for this three-level Europe. Uh, they are not exactly what you were proposing. They are sort of, I think, similar to the ideas um, one could possibly use them in order to, 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 to get to this point. And that would be my first question. The second um, relates a little bit um, to these um, illiberal systems um, and, and the question of enlargement of the European Union. We're currently talking about enlargement in the Western Balkan. And <clears throat> well, although I'm very much in favor of enlarging the union and 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 integrating other countries into the european union especially the countries that are really working hard in order to um to get in line with the european requirements and i'm wondering if there isn't some sort of danger in such an enlargement if we do not have and i don't see them at the moment sufficient instruments to prevent um a development where countries that are newly new members of the union can develop into such illiberal systems as well, so that we do not strengthen the European Union by enlarging it, but we sort of weaken it from the inside. So that's a question that I wanted to, to ask as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I have no magic solution for that. And uh, we are discussing uh, what we think is good or bad or, or is not that good. And probably uh, you are right. We can try with the existing uh, uh, structures like the Council of Europe and so on and so on. But I'm not sure that my idea was that for the, for the first level, the level of uh, European Union, we did not create nothing. Uh, we have exactly the same, uh, and we have to expel the others who don't comply with the rule. But then we have to create a second community uh, for just with a, um, a common market and uh, some political, or less, too, too little common policies and uh, the rejection of the idea of the primacy. That would be another uh, community in another uh, treaty that should be prepared. And in the end, we had to create another one for the minimum political and economic. So uh, when I speak of three, one we have already. We don't need to, to uh, do nothing. We just need to separate the waters, expelling some from, well, asking that. Do you want to, to keep on doing or do you want to keep on joking with us. Uh, if you want to keep on joking, well, you can joke uh, with some uh, some benefits if you go to the second level or to the third. Uh, so it's it was not a question of creating everything. It was idea of, uh, it was not exactly of the same when uh, we were talking about uh, the speeds of Europe. That's not the point. Uh, uh, 
there is a Europe that is the one that we have and can go on with all the countries that are interested in keeping on integration. And for those who don't want, we must be clear and put them out of the European Union, but not out of Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, we could create the second and the third uh, level. But, well, that's uh, just a proposal. I have no, no influence whatsoever. Uh, but from my point of view, that would be clear. And that is not the risk that we point out. The risk of uh, stopping or making uh, less or giving less importance to the EU because there were three. There is the EU and two other things who we'll, we'll should choose a name, a common market, something like that, and uh, create also a system of cooperation. And uh, um, not to, uh, it was a way of making a better functioning of all those things. Uh, regarding uh, the Western Balkans, yes, I, I share your, your uh, fear from what can happen. That's why I say that if they were integrated first in the first level, then eventually in the second and see if they can come to the third, uh, could be a good solution. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what happened with Turkey. Uh, Turkey uh, uh, is a candidate and keeps on being a candidate. And, uh, but if they were invited to integrate something with uh, some cooperation, they, ex they would accept because they accept it already, as a matter of fact. So the idea is to approve what already exists with some countries that are not uh, uh, integrated in Europe and create two more organizations with a different name, of course, uh, uh, different structure, a different way of working, but in order to keep unity for Europe, because that would permit a uh, joint voice in all the crisis situations, and at the same time, differentiation in the levels of integration. So that was my point. But of course, it's not just debatable as we are doing here, but also it's a, it's a, a near uh, possibility that I thought uh, Having been, uh, and I have to thank you guys first, uh, Paco and then Friedrich, for making me think about it. <laughs> because I said, Well, what can I say about the situation? I mean, trying to uh, do something creative, and, uh, and I had this idea. Uh, it's not more than that. But thank you very much for your, for your remarks.